Hello everyone, I have been asked to respond to Coach Redpill's video on Salvador Allende, so that is what I'm going to do. Now Coach Redpill has made two videos on Chilean politics. The first one was entitled The Pinochet Problem, whilst the second one, which I will be responding to, was simply called Salvador Allende. In both of these videos, Red Pill excessively uses anecdotal evidence that is contradicted by historical fact. For example, the left says that people who lived under the Pinochet dictatorship lived in fear all the time. I lived in the Pinochet dictatorship. I didn't live in fear. I was once picked up by a military patrol in Chile in 1984. I was 16 years old. I was picked up and I was held overnight in a military prison. Okay. I was, I've been dining out on this story for years. And the fact of the matter is, you know, it sounds really truculent. You sound like, holy shit, you were in a Pinochet jail. What happened? Did they torture you? Did they, they waterboard you? Did they beat you with a truncheon? What happened? And well. Coach Redpill goes on to say that he was thrown into a military prison for a night because he was violating the curfew. So his argument is that being imprisoned by the Pinochet government was no big deal. Of course, he is attempting to use his unverified personal story to counteract the verified stories that detail the Chilean junta's human rights abuses. Now, there are thousands of verified stories about what really happened in Pinochet's prisons, the most famous being this one. Thousands of people were rounded up and taken to a stadium in the capital where many were tortured and murdered. Among them was the singer and songwriter Victor Hara. The 38-year-old's left-leaning lyrics were well known, and they were enough to get him arrested on the day of the coup. Days later, his body was found in a street. He'd been shot 44 times, and the signs of torture to his body included the crushing of bones in his hand. Coach Redpill also claims that people did not live in fear under the military dictatorship. This is ridiculous because it was clear from the very outset that the military government wanted to be feared. Its brutal treatment of unarmed and peaceful protesters like Victor Hara, the establishment of concentration camps and the bombing of La Manida Palace were all designed to send a sinister message to the Chilean people. A murderous and authoritarian government had replaced a democratic one. Now that we have seen how Coach Redpill operates, I will now begin the response to his Salvador Allende video. Now in his rambling preamble to that video, he shows everyone that he has no idea what socialism is by claiming that neoliberal socialism is a thing, which is utterly ridiculous. So I'm going to skip that part and go straight into his arguments about the actual topic. Salvador Allende won the election of 1970 for president of Chile, and that election right away had an asterisk to it. And it was a very simple asterisk. You see, the uh, presidential elections in Chile were every six years. And in 1970, Salvador Allende ran against two other opponents. There were three candidates for that election. There was Salvador Allende, who represented the popular unity. That was a com election uh, amalgamation, really, of communist parties, socialist parties, and, and hard left parties. Then the center parties were led by Rodomiro Tomic, and that was the um, Christian Democrats. And the right-wing party, headed by the um, uh, Partido Nacional, the national party, was led by uh, Jorge Alessandri. Those were the three candidates in the 1970 election, and what happened was that Allende won a plurality, not a majority, a plurality of the votes, because there was a three-way tie, statistically speaking. This is mostly correct, except Allende received 36.6% of the vote at the 1970 election. Keep in mind, in the Chilean 1958 presidential election, the conservative candidate, George Alessandri, became president after receiving only 31% of the vote. And that election, in the 64 election, he got 39% of the vote, which was statistically and in absolute terms more votes than he got in the 1970 election. But what had happened in the 1964 election was that it was Allende running against Eduardo Frei Montalva, the Christian Democrat. And the right-wing parties decided not to field a candidate in the 1964 election and instead support Eduardo Frey. And so, in 1970, Allende got fewer votes than in 64, but he won the presidency. 
As Coach Redpill noted, the 1964 election was a two-horse race, whilst the 1970 election was a three-horse race. It should be noted, however, that the Christian Democratic candidate, Tomich, had also advocated leftist policies such as the nationalisation of Chile's copper mines. Of course, that split the leftist vote in the 1970 election. Still, in that election, 65% of Chileans endorsed the leftist economic program where the nationalisation of the Chilean copper mines was the top priority. So, what did Allende do in short order? He started implementing socialist economic policies. And one of the first policies that he implemented, and I'm simplifying here grossly, but just to make it clear to you what he was more or less doing, he basically, and in essence, froze the prices of all goods and services and raised wages by 10%. Oh, what do you think is gonna happen? Well, the obvious happened, hyperinflation. It happened like that. This is incorrect. When Allende came to office, inflation was 33%. After a year, it was down to 19%. Indeed, in Allende's first year, there was an economic boom where the working class were the main beneficiaries. The popularity of his policies were also reflected in the 1971 municipal elections, in which his Popular Unity Coalition received 50% of all votes cast. Within uh, a few months of these economic policies happening, Chilean uh, uh, inflation, the inflation of the escudo, which was the, the currency at the time, the escudo started to lose value rapidly. I mean, it started just to disintegrate as a currency. The hyperinflation started happening later, mainly because of the actions of the opposition-controlled Congress, which refused to pass any of Allende's anti-inflationary policies. As I mentioned before, Allende had stimulated the economy which resulted in the boom year of 1971. However, such policies were inflationary and needed to be addressed. Of course, that left the government with two choices, austerity or to raise taxes on the wealthy. Allende, of course, opted for the tax increases. When Allende went to the Congress and asked for approval for these tax increases, the opposition parties that controlled the chamber refused to pass them because they simply wanted to see Allende's government destroyed. So, the blame lies with the Christian Democratic Party and the Chilean National Party. And all of the successive governments had been very careful to maintain a positive balance of trade and to never ever run any kind of uh, fiscal deficit. Allende inherited a high inflation rate, a high unemployment rate, a recession and a small fiscal deficit. So it is a lie to say that Allende inherited a good economic situation. As for maintaining a positive balance of trade, it is quite impossible to do when your price, when the price of your primary export, copper, falls by 25%. Copper, of course, made up 80% of all Chile's exports at the time. So the previous governments that Coach Red Pill clearly admires failed to diversify the economy. Right? Chile, Chile's economy went down the tubes because by these policies, what happened, think of it in these terms. Suppose I manufacture, just for the sake of argument, toothpaste, and I sell, I sell my toothpaste at 100, right? Now I pay my workers and my expenses and what have you is 95, again, for the sake of argument. So that five, the difference between 100, my sales price, and the 95 that I pay my workers, that is my margin, my profit margin, right? But now the government is telling me that I have to up the wages of my workers. I have to pay them 105, but I can't raise my prices. I have to still sell at 100. So what does that mean? I'm gonna start losing money, right? Am I going to continue to operate? No, I'm going to close my factory. I'm going to close my factory because I can't afford to be paying these workers because I'm losing money. Who in his right mind would continue to operate if he's losing money? Nobody, of course, right? And so what happened was that I closed my toothpaste factory and all of a sudden, in short order, there's no more toothpaste. People just don't have toothpaste. In essence, this is what happened because of Allende's policies. The real reason why there were so many shortages was the fact that businessmen had been hoarding goods. How do we know this? Because the shops were full of goods the day after the coup, which shows that the government was right all along. There was economic turmoil in Chile. There was a trucking strike, 
which was very important for Chile because we're a very long country. We're like a spaghetti, we're so long. And our highways are basic, and trucking is basic. Um, and trucks stopped because they were paid not to work. And they received more pay not working than working. And let, let's remember that the day after the coup, all the supermarkets were full of food. The economic hardship caused by shortages should be blamed on the corrupt capitalist merchants and not the END government. And the government started to take over the distribution because there were no goods and services anymore because, you know, everything had shut down, everything was falling apart, right? People were making huge lines for toilet paper and toothpaste and everything, the basics, what you need to survive. They were lining up all over the place. A black market flourished, and the black market, of course, didn't want to school those, which were losing value on a daily basis. They wanted dollars, only dollars. And so people started selling everything that they had in order to get dollars to buy the basics. I'm talking heating oil. I'm talking, you know, toothpaste and, and toilet paper and food. And whose fault is that? the governments or the criminals who were hoarding goods to bring down the legitimate government of Chile. The Allende government created the CAPS, the famous CAPS, J-A-P, Juntas de Abastecimiento Popular. That means literally committees for popular supply, basically rationing. And why were these committees set up in the first place? to respond to the shortage crisis which was caused by hoarding. Once again, your argument about the shortages is severely weakened by the fact that the shops were full of these vital goods the day after the coup. And in every neighborhood, you'd go to your local hub and get your little ration card, right? And it had to be, you know, stamped by the head of the hub, by the, the head of the committee of popular supply. And that head, of the Committee of Popular Supply was a member of the popular unity leftist parties. And if he or she didn't like you, <laughs> fuck you. No food for you, motherfucker. You're an oligarch. You're an enemy of the people. That's what started to happen in Chile. Where's your evidence? The truth is that these Chilean oligarchs were buying their goods on the black market where there was a plentiful supply. So you are correct when you claim that food became politicized, but you are blaming the wrong people. The situation in Chile was just, just deteriorating on a daily basis, and the fucking leftists today, fucking pieces of shit who don't know any goddamn history, what do they say? They say it was Nixon who did it. That Nixon, because it's true, Nixon had a meeting with Henry Kissinger, and you know after the whole uh, Allende debacle, and he said that he wanted the Chilean economy to scream. But you have to keep in mind something very important. See, today, the world economies are completely integrated. In 1970, they were not. Chile's largest training partner was not the United States. It was Argentina and Peru, well, obviously, because they were right next door. The United States, oh, that was like some fantasy land. It was like way far away. America could want to squeeze the Chilean economy all they wanted. They weren't going to do fucking shit to the Chilean economy, especially not after all the American companies were expropriated by the Allende regime. The Americans were out of the ball game, you know, and, and leftists today say that the Nixon administration screwed over Allende. Uh-uh. No. Allende fucked over the country all by himself. All on his lonesome, he screwed the Chilean people and destroyed the Chilean economy. Complete rubbish. The US not only cut off aid to Chile, which was still a developing country, but also funded opposition groups to bring harm to Allende's government. One of the groups they supported was the terrorist movement known as the Fatherland and Liberty Nationalist Front. This group blew up electrical towers, bridges, and oil pipelines, as well as sabotaging factory machinery. Furthermore, the CIA funneled money to strikers, paying them not to work. The US was trying to destroy the economy, and largely succeeded. Now, it's all good and fine and funny, actually, to be talking about this, but I'm gonna tell you a story that's not so fucking funny, okay? You know, Allende was creating a paramilitary force that was basically loyal to the popular unity, but not loyal to the Chilean citizenry. Allende did not create that group, you nitwit. This group was actually severely criticized by members of Allende's popular unity coalition. 
So no, they were not Salvador Allende's stormtroopers, but a separate group on the left that believed in revolution rather than reformism. And I'm going to tell you a horrifying story because this is true. These people, they would go to farms, okay, and they would expropriate the land in the name of the people. And they would kill the landowners, kill the landowners and their families. Now, it's not that I heard this story, that, that you know, I read it in some book or, or you know, the, the Pinochet government, you know, later would spread this, uh, you know, propaganda. No, I heard this story from a farmer to whom it almost happened. Now, this farmer, he was a classmate's dad. I'm not going to listen to your anecdotal evidence. As far as I know, the characters as you mentioned in your story could be fictional. If you want me to believe your story, provide some evidence. ...who pays his workers fairly and is just a decent guy and does what he's supposed to do as a man, as a moral man, well, those are the people that the leftists targeted. They killed about 500 people during the Allende government. 500 people murdered. According to the Junta's infamous white book, 96 people on both sides were killed due to political violence under Allende. So you have clearly just made the 500 figure up in order to have your argument. That makes you a liar. As for the land seizures, most of these were done by peasant groups that were not affiliated with the END government. These seizures had actually started under Eduardo Frey. The END government wanted an armed insurrection. The Allende government wanted the popular unity to become the leading edge of the revolution, of the socialist revolution. Because ultimately you have to understand, Salvador Allende was a Leninist and he was a Maoist who believed in total land redistribution. I mean, it was almost like you wanted to impose what became known as Pol Potism, you know? Because Pol Pot, what he did in Cambodia in 1975, that was essentially what Salvador Allende wanted to do in 1973. Allende did want to redistribute land to the peasants, but he was certainly not a popotist or a Leninist. Despite being a self-proclaimed radical, Allende did not touch the Chilean parliamentary system. He did not replace the Supreme Court. He did not ban any political parties, nor did he try to seize control of the military. He did plan on introducing more radical policies, but believed he needed to increase his vote share. So no, he was not a Maoist who believed in people's war. He was actually a mild-mannered reformist. In August of 1973, the parliament passed by an absolute majority, almost a unanimity, a resolution asking for the military to step in and overthrow the Allende government. The Parliament of Chile asked the military to step in because the country was collapsing into chaos. This is completely true. Both the Christian Democrats and the Chilean National Party did vote for the overthrow of Chilean democracy. The despicable Eduardo Frey of the Christian Democrats believed that the military would make him president. Meanwhile, Japa of the Chilean National Party wanted the military dictatorship to continue for many years because he was an authoritarian conservative. In fact, he used to be a former member of the Chilean National Socialist Party. So, self-interest was the reason why the leaders of the Christian Democrats and the National Party supported the coup. It certainly wasn't because they were patriots. And that was that. It took about 18 months to pick off all of these um, socialist paramilitary people. Pinochet himself admitted that fighting lasted only four hours because there was no significant leftist paramilitary force in Chile. In, in point of fact, actually, the socialist paramilitary continued with their activities of, you know, bombing high tension uh, towers, of shooting up banks to steal money to finance their operations. Now, this, this I know because I experienced it. I experienced blackouts during 1984. 11 years after the overthrow of Allende, the paramilitary were still going strong. They assassinated people. They tried to assassinate Pinochet once. Coach Redpill is talking about the Manro... 
Coach Redpeel is talking about the Manuel Rodriguez Patriotic Front, which was founded in 1983 and had nothing to do with Allende. Socialism doesn't work, but worse than that, I mean, it's perfectly fine if a system or an idea, an ideology doesn't work. Socialism wants slavery of the people. That's its goal. It wants to put people under its boot heel. Now, I know this because it was tried in Chile and it failed, thank goodness. It failed. Now, I've read a lot of history, a lot of history of Russia. Uh, and, you know, it talks about the gulags and Lenin and all the rest of it, but it's just, you know, pages in a book. When you're standing face to face with a man who was almost killed by leftist paramilitary forces, whose family was almost butchered by these leftists, it's, it's just a different experience. All of a sudden you realize viscerally how evil socialism really is, how evil this ideology really is. It seems that Coach Ropo has forgotten that Augusto Pinochet is by far the biggest mass murderer in Chile's history. No amount of anecdotal evidence will be able to change that fact, so his rant on the evils of socialism falls flat. It just shows that he is a sanctimonious windbag who does not care about evidence. Indeed, some of the claims he made would make the old members of the Junta cringe. He claimed that Allende killed 500 people. The Junta claimed that 96 people on both sides perished due to political reasons during the Allende years. He also claimed that left-wing paramilitaries kept fighting for 18 months. Pinochet himself admitted that the fighting lasted for only four hours. So Coach Redpill is both a fool and a liar who should not be taken seriously.